As the hammer and sickle descended above the Kremlin on Christmas Day 1991, America breathed a final sigh of relief. The days of duck and cover were officially over. For the first time in modern history, one nation prevailed in nearly every domain, from military to economic, cultural, and scientific. And it wasn't even close. In the absence of an imminent threat, a worthy strategic rival motivating it to put men on the moon, sprint faster, or invent the internet, the United States experienced a luxury without precedent. A choice. So secure was its territory, so superior was its navy, and dominant its economy that it could simply decide its future. Did it want to buy with this lead the ability to ease its foot off the gas, to right-size its military for the new lower level of danger? For a brief moment, that seemed like a real possibility. Bush Sr. spoke of a peace dividend, the productive redistribution of resources away from the military. 98 major US military bases were closed between 1988 and 95, along with hundreds of smaller installations, saving taxpayers an estimated $57 billion. And the total defense budget decreased or at least stayed flat relative to GDP for all but one of the next 15 years. By no means was America relinquishing its dominance, but it was recalibrating. Then, on September 11, 2001, the decision was made. This time, definitively. Good evening. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. Rather than accept the unthinkable, that America, like any country, will always be somewhat vulnerable, George Bush redefined the word safe. Safety was no longer about making informed risk-reward trade-offs. Since 9-11, safety in America means near invincibility, nothing less than zero casualties with zero room for error, everywhere, at all times. In military parlance, this meant shifting from a threat-based model in which we plan and budget our forces based on those of our enemies to a capabilities-based approach, in which we strive for the ability to do everything regardless of the actual threats. It didn't matter whether a hypothetical attack was realistic, never mind actually advantageous to the attacker, we should be able to prevent it just in case. Should two separate wars ever break out simultaneously, the US military should be able to fight both, each with maximum force. Thus, after a brief 10-year intermission, this new unattainable definition of safety allowed existing yet previously disregarded threats like North Korea, Iran, and Iraq to neatly fill the gap left by the Soviet Union. In fact, because there were numerically more of them, to many people the world felt even more dangerous. Unlike the Soviets, who Americans feared for their strength, real or imagined, these new threats were said to be irrational, and thus undeterrable. The United States decided that it could no longer afford to take its foot off the gas. Given how fast the enemy was approaching, it had no choice but to go full steam ahead using what lead it still had just to maintain it. Mere dominance alone spelled eventual defeat. Instead, Bush Jr. endorsed a strategic ideal that had long lingered in American politics. Primacy. Where dominance means having a stronger military, beating everyone else at the game, primacy means being so far ahead that you set the very rules of the game. Not only can you defeat anyone else in battle, but you ensure that no one else even has the will to fight in the first place. Bush spelled this out clearly when he said, quote, If we wait for threats to fully materialize, we will have waited too long. The US, he said, must maintain strengths beyond challenge. And since there already were no challengers nearby, this meant traversing an entire ocean in either direction. The world is all too familiar with the fallout from this redefinition of safety, 
the war in Afghanistan, Yemen, Iraq, and long lines at American airports, to name just a few. But by far the most overlooked consequence was Bush's withdrawal from something called the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. And to understand why, we have to go way back to the early Cold War. For those of us born in the last roughly 50 years, the only world we know is one of mutually assured destruction. An obviously terrifying concept. But before MAD, there was an even darker 20-year period most either don't know or prefer not to think about. A time when the United States was seriously talking about winning nuclear war. The Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy administrations commanded significantly larger nuclear stockpiles than the Soviets, giving them the theoretical ability to knock out all their opponent's forces before it had a chance to respond. And because they suspected, correctly, that this lead wouldn't last, they felt the pressure to use it before you lose it. From this perspective that war was inevitable, a larger and preemptive first strike was actually safer and more responsible. Better to overwhelm the Soviets now than risk a global nuclear apocalypse later on. For years, not only were extensive battle plans drafted for a preemptive attack, but many called for using everything at once. Later, when the Americans conjured fever dreams of a surprise attack from the Soviets, they concluded that although one-third of the US population would be killed, victory would be America's, as it would then be able to, quote, eliminate the USSR as a world power. To the US military at the time, nukes were just a bigger, faster, stronger version of the bombs they already had. As if all this weren't insane enough, civil applications were suggested for nukes. Edward Teller, a scientist close to Ronald Reagan, proposed such bizarre plans as using nuclear weapons to widen the Panama Canal and speed up industrial mining. This was the Wild West for crazy atomic ideas. Fortunately, sanity ultimately prevailed. Or more accurately, the Soviets started catching up and nuclear war began to be seen as an unwinnable outcome. Faced with the possibility that one side might suddenly win the arms race by building either enough weapons to overwhelm the other or an effective defense against them, and feel the need, as America nearly did, to use this advantage, they came to an agreement. The 1972 Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty limited the defenses each country could build forcing them to confront their vulnerability. In the end, the treaty didn't stop the Soviets from building more weapons, but it did give both nations an interest in peace. And that peace would last for the remainder of the Cold War. The treaty even survived the fall of the Soviet Union, with Russia inheriting its place. That is, until Bush withdrew after 9-11. Leaving the treaty, the president explained, would allow the country to erect a shield protecting all 50 states from nuclear missiles by intercepting them on the way. The only problem was that it didn't exist. In fact, spoilers, 20 years and many billions of dollars later, and America is still not protected. In other words, this was Bush announcing America's intention to become untouchable. This was him giving the world a heads up that he intended to spend near unlimited funds to ensure the US had no skin in the game, allowing it to intervene when and where it pleased, with no repercussions. Needless to say, this did not go well. Shockingly, Russia and China and North Korea didn't just shrug their shoulders and admit defeat. Instead, they responded, predictably, with countermeasures. Because military technology takes years to develop, it took nearly two decades after Bush's withdrawal. But we are, right now, entering an arms race. America is racing toward invulnerability, and its adversaries are inventing all kinds of new and wacky ways to get through its defenses. There are a million such examples, but let's just start with the absolute simplest. American missile defenses have failed 44% of their 18 tests between 1999 and 2018, 
despite being, quote, scripted for success according to the Pentagon's former director of testing. Knowing that his life is at stake, imagine that Kim Jong-un, in a crisis, decided to throw the US the most basic of curveballs, a decoy. Because intercontinental ballistic missiles travel through space, where there's no air resistance, even radar-reflective mylar balloons would be difficult to distinguish from the actual warhead. What that means is that Kim Jong-un could likely foil our advanced missile defenses with the right-shaped balloon. Another tactic involves packing a dozen or so nukes on a single rocket, a relatively cost-effective way to overwhelm America's defenses. On the more high-tech side, there are hypersonics. While a traditional ballistic missile travels up and down on a predictable trajectory, hypersonic missiles glide all over the place, making them far, far harder to intercept. Both China and Russia have already developed this technology, and could even fire them over the South Pole, bypassing America's defenses in Alaska. None of these countermeasures are technically insurmountable. Given the size of its budget, we can expect the US military to eventually overcome them. The problem is that this is not an even playing field. Shooting bullets is just easier than intercepting those bullets with other bullets. By the time the US fills a loophole, at least one of a half dozen of its enemies is likely to have found a new one. Russia, for instance, recently tested a nuclear-powered cruise missile with virtually unlimited range that spews radioactive exhaust everywhere it goes. In 2019, it purchased 30 giant underwater drone torpedoes capable of delivering a radioactive tsunami to an American port undetected. These weapons just get crazier and crazier. Now, the Pentagon sees in these new Russian, Chinese, and North Korean weapons evidence that the world is becoming objectively more dangerous. Proof that we need stronger defenses now more than ever. But because its task is to implement, not decide, US strategy, the Department of Defense has a blind spot. What it doesn't see is that these new weapons are being developed in response to America's post-9-11 pursuit of invulnerability. That our missile defenses are too weak to actually protect us, yet strong enough to provoke our adversaries, who spend pennies on the dollar to defeat them. That, in trying to make America completely safe, we're actually making it less safe. Even if we did manage to intercept, say, an incoming North Korean missile, our defending missile would look nearly indistinguishable from a nuclear attack to someone like China or Russia. If Russia saw what could be a nuclear warhead headed its way, would it immediately retaliate? Probably not, but probably isn't very reassuring when we're talking about nuclear war. In fairness, it's no surprise that the military pursues military solutions. That's its duty. The problem is that there are no checks and balances. Experts have had serious doubts about missile defense since at least the 1960s, at one point even laughing off Soviet attempts to build it as a waste of money. But when faced with a crisis, whether during the Reagan administration in the 80s or Bush in 2001, presidents have found it politically easier to promise something that can never be delivered than admit vulnerability. Rather than restrain the military, politicians enable it. Then, because their goal of total invincibility is unattainable, the defenses they build inevitably fail, presenting them with a new problem. To be honest, they think, and admit that the US is vulnerable would scare our allies and embolden our enemies. In truth, the Institute for Defense Analyses argues that not even the Pentagon likely knows the real effectiveness of our missile defenses. They've been tested less than once a year on average, and only under the most optimal conditions. Thus, they feel they have no choice but to mislead the public. Despite a 44% failure rate, the Navy told Congress in 2016 that it had high confidence in its success, and Bush warned, you fire, we're going to shoot it down, during a 2004 speech. Similar claims go as far back as Reagan.
Americans, not knowing any better, believe them. In one poll from 2000, for instance, 58% of respondents assumed they were already protected from nuclear missiles. This overconfidence, in turn, leads the country to pursue more aggressive tactics. It's easy to dismiss Kim Jong-un as an annoyance when you believe you're bulletproof. You might also feel less urgency to solve the problem diplomatically. Meanwhile, this dismissiveness makes Kim Jong-un feel the need to assert his earnestness. Until and unless the US takes him seriously, he won't be confident he's deterring an attack. In other words, politicians, scared of being weak in a crisis, enable the military. Then, trapped by their own decisions, both mislead the public, who adopt a more aggressive posture. Finally, that aggressive posture leads to more crises, completing the cycle. The point is not that America is to blame for all of Russia or China or North Korea's actions. It isn't. Neither does this have anything to do with the war in Ukraine. Nor is this an argument against all missile defense. When and where it actually saves lives, that's a different story. The point is that America can effectively defend itself and its allies even while maintaining its dominance without pursuing policies that only make it unsafe. There's no trade-off here between protecting American lives and not irritating evil dictators, because our missile defenses only make the world more dangerous for Americans. The United States is in a strange position. Separated from all its adversaries by the two largest oceans, blessed with the geography of success, and spoiled with unthinkable wealth and influence, it's the only country in the world where primacy feels like a choice. The only one where absolute, total, impenetrable security feels genuinely achievable. If only we fixed this or that technical problem or spent X number of dollars more. But the US has spent no shortage of money, $350 billion by some estimates, and no shortage of time, over 70 years. Every modern president, Republican or Democrat, has either endorsed, pursued, or at least left untouched America's missile defenses. The United States hasn't failed for lack of trying. It's failed because the goal of total invincibility is impossible. The problem arises when this single-minded obsession prevents America from noticing when it becomes self-destructive, when our desire to become invincible puts us in needless additional danger. To resist this very human temptation to seek total security is unthinkable. To admit vulnerability contradicts basic military strategy and common sense. And yet, the United States must. Its refusal to do so is already responsible for one of the largest unforced errors in the history of US-China relations, and it all has to do with nuclear weapons. In this new episode of my Nebula original series, China Actually, out now on today's sponsor, Nebula, I explain why China has one of the most sensible and level-headed policies towards nuclear weapons, and why that might be about to change. This is the sixth video in the series, and you can watch all of them, plus get access to dozens of other exclusives, not to mention ad-free and early videos, on Nebula, the streaming platform built by and for creators. Best of all, access to Nebula is included, at no extra charge, when you sign up for CuriosityStream for just $15 a year with the link in the description. On CuriosityStream, you'll find great feature-length documentaries, like this fascinating one catching up with the kids who George Bush was reading to when the Twin Towers fell. Click the link on screen right now to get both Nebula and CuriosityStream for an amazing 15 bucks a year and go watch my new original episode on Nebula.